last time we uh, showed uh, that there is a connection between the word Zemzem, or at least the origin of that word, and Satan, uh, which is uh, uh, very troubling to, to say the least, but it ties back into the Zoroastrian religion. That's why today's episode is going to focus on the connection between the Zoroastrian religion and the reshaping of early Islam. And with us here, of course, remotely to expand on this, our dear brother, Mel. Mel, welcome back. Well, it's great to be back. Um, so today I'm going to be looking at the wider picture and looking at the, the various ways that Zoroastrianism has influenced the beginnings of Islam and, and really shaped it the way it is today. Um, I suppose the, the main context of this is that really a pure religion should not have these sort of influences in place. They should be rejecting any um, influences from a polytheistic religion, but they didn't seem to concern themselves with that in the first few centuries. So let's first of all start by considering where the Sunnah was written. So if we take a look at all of the places where the, the Sunnah, which is the Hadiths and so forth, they were all written in Zoroastrian lands. So as you could expect, this would have shaped the, the way the stories were told and the people would have at the very least been former Zoroastrians um, and the whole culture would have remained predominantly Zoroastrian for many centuries. It took a long time. In fact, Zoroastrianism survived even to, to this day. Um, so it would have obviously had a huge influence on early Islam. Now, we also could look at the, the times of prayer. So in the Quran, it refers to four prayer times, evening, morning, afternoon, and noon. But in Islamic practice, we have five prayer times. Now, it just so happens, maybe it's just a crazy coincidence, but the exact same prayer times are in Zoroastrianism exists in Islam. As you can see, um, they have different names, but they are um, the same times and, and five times during the day. The only uh, minor difference is instead of um, a call to prayer, there is a bell rung in Zoroastrianism. Another similarity is the fact that Zoroastrians wash be their, their head and their face and limbs before they go to pray. So that's a, another um, telltale sign. Um, in terms of the prayers, well, the prayers have to be said in a certain language. So obviously it's Arabic in Islam, but in Zoroastrianism, they pray them in Avesta. Um, and then there's the holiest spot. Well, the holy spot in a mosque is the, the wall facing Mecca and is called the Qibla. In the Aguri, uh, the room where the Atash uh, Padshah is enthroned, is also called the, the Qibla, very similar. A Muslim will perform the Sajjah in front of the Qibla, and so also will the Zoroastrian perform the Sajda before his Qibla, both involve kneeling down and touching the forehead to the ground, so very similar indeed. And then there's a holy month in both cases. In Islam, it's Ramadan. In Zoroastrianism, it's Bahman. And in that uh, situation, the abstain from flesh. Um, in both religions, there's a reference to the Chinvat bridge, which is a mythical bridge that a person crosses to enter heaven. Um, and, in the Quran, yeah. and demons guard the foot of the bridge and argue with the gods over the soul's face and so forth. And of course, a, a, another big one is the fact that the Jinn seems to have come from Zoroastrianism their Zoroastrian origin is given away by the fact that they're said to have been made of smokeless fire. And obviously, with the fire temples and so on, with Zoroastrianism, it's a big focus to their religion. Um, there is obviously some dispute about the direct origin of it. Did it come from Aramaic? Did it come from um, Persian? Um, I would argue, considering all of the mythologies around the Jinn found in Persia, I would think that the predominant influence comes directly from the Persians. Okay. And the Jinn, just to, to point out, are kind of like an ambiguous being. They are kind of both good and bad, but essentially they're demons. And so that's that's that. I'm going to hand it back to you. Nice Wonderful. I mean, again, it's fascinating, really, when you see stuff like this happening. Uh, it's very clear, uh, Jay, uh, that uh, you cannot escape from the mere fact that a religion like Zoroastrianism, that it pre-existed before Islam, has many practices that it's obvious 
It's been borrowed. It's been borrowed. Yeah, I, I'm fascinating that you, because you're bringing up a lot of antecedents. What's fa you know when you look at the Quran, you can see that the Quran only has three prayers: the morning, noon, and night. Where do you get the other two prayers? We've always questioned this. Well, Mel, you seem to have come upon it because that's so specific that you have three prayers at night in Zoroastrianism. I don't know of any other place that has three prayers at night, and yet you found it here. Trick, great stuff, because this that supports exactly what we've been asking. We've been um, doing a lot of series here in the studio and looking at the sources and looking at the antecedents. We've been asking this question. When you are trying to put a book together, you've got to borrow from many other sources. This case, you're talking not only the book itself, but you're talking about the practices. The prayers, three in the evening, one in the afternoon, one in the morning, are not in the Quran. It looks like these have been added because we don't even hear about these five prayers until al-Buhari in the ninth century. Well, that, where do you think al-Buhari was living? And where do you think he did all his work? There in Baghdad. Where do you think Zoroastrian had its greatest input? There up in that area, what is today Iraq? Well done, Mel. Looks like you've really hit onto something on this point. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mel. And uh, uh, next time, I think we are going to talk about the Barak, I believe. That's right, yeah. Very good. So, uh, Very good. We are going to talk about this mythical, uh, uh, you know, uh, animal uh, that uh, has wings. That uh, Miraj taking him up across yeah, why the Buraq up from the Isra and the Miraj to Jerusalem as well. Yeah, looking forward to what you uh, will uh, will be sharing with us again. Thank you everyone for joining us here. This is a new series that we've been doing. It's a short series, you know, intentionally. Uh, we want to give you the gist of it. Uh, hopefully, me and Mel, and maybe even me and Mel and Jay, will do a live stream, also panel discussion to expand further on this and maybe expand on it later by way of recorded uh, shows like this. Uh, uh, of course, the series is called Exposing the Myth. And next time, we will uh, deal with yet another myth that Islam obviously uh, has borrowed from somewhere, possibly from the Zoroastrian religion itself. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Jay. And uh, everyone, thank you. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel Sierra International and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.